thank you for coming downstairs. We have still three interesting uh, points uh, of the evening. Uh, first, we have uh, two short uh, stage interviews with uh, entrepreneurs from one is from America, the second is from Australia. So two different sides of the world, but both very experienced. Uh, one in uh, investing in new technologies and the second in the old technologies, uh, such as mining, right? So uh, please uh, welcome Mr. John Chisholm, please. Who, whose book is somewhere around there. Can you please handle me the book which is there? Th thank you. So, in advance of the uh, later of the discussion that we will have later on with the other panelists, I just like to tell you that uh, the most interesting questions from the audience will be priced uh, with this excellent book about uh, entrepreneurship. So, the book, of course, written by Mr. Chisholm. Huh? Oh, you can take a look. Everyone can take take, can take a look. Pass it over, please. All right, uh, so uh, we've been talking about very serious issues related to institutional things. Uh, EU European Union, the cr criteria you have to fulfill with, uh, uh, you have to meet in order to join European Union. But uh, we are at the free market um, conference, so we need to talk a bit about markets, about uh, the essence of markets, which is competition and entrepreneurship. Uh, Yesterday, two days ago, me and Tomek Wroblewski, we were attending a conference in Katowice. We were presenting our report on ESG. These are criteria, new kind of non-financial reporting uh, measures that European Union have, uh, has implemented. And the, uh, also, a lot of business people were uh, uh, discussing it in the panel, uh, big corporations and they avoided uh, the word profit as the devil avoids holy water. So uh, they presented their activities, their entrepreneurial activities as something that was uh, only there for the common good, not for their own good. They don't want to make money. Money is but the common good, the public good is something worth pursuing. So um, is this, uh, and this is my question for you, is, this, is there any place in the world that is friendly toward like a classical entrepreneurship, which is based on profit seeking. This mindset that you're talking about of the stakeholder uh, being very broad and including the entire community as well as employees and customers and shareholders, I think one of the reasons it's gotten so much traction is because it's so ambiguous. I mean, uh, Milton Friedman would say that the only real stakeholder is the shareholder. That the, uh, but, but, but any manager knows they have to uh, worry about the customer and partners and employees. Um, so I think it's gotten traction because it's, I mean, I can, I can support the notion. I, I agree with Milton Friedman, but I also agree that customers and Employees are important to keep satisfied. Uh, anyway, to answer more directly your question about where in the world are people still focused on uh, the virtue of entrepreneurship? Well, I've lived and worked in Silicon Valley for the last 40 years. And uh, despite the problems of California, uh, high cost of living, uh, high crime in cities like San Francisco where I live, uh, high cost of housing, uh, a mass exodus of professionals from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas, to Florida, to Tennessee, other states that don't have any state income tax. In spite of that, I think the entrepreneurs are themselves still very enthusiastic uh, about entrepreneurship and the virtue and believe in the virtues of entrepreneurship not just in the US but <clears throat> also in China 
I, I've been to China 15 times in recent years. Uh, my book has been translated into Chinese. I go back, I was going back twice a year before the pandemic. Uh, and I've found tremendous enthusiasm uh, for entrepreneurship there. And my sense is that as a new venture grows, the communist central government eventually intervenes and intrudes on the business. But until it reaches some critical point, uh, entrepreneurs are generally free to uh, you know, pursue their goals. And I think there's a message there for Europe that that's something we ought to try to emulate. So uh, <clears throat> as we already established, Ukraine wants to join Europe rather than Asia, rather than Russia. It wants to join our cooperation framework based on capitalism. Yet in Europe, uh, you didn't mention Europe among the places that are friendly towards entrepreneurship. You mentioned the US, uh, Silicon Valley, you mentioned China. Um, well, the question is, uh, how do you think uh, Europe, in your opinion, uh, will shape it poli its policies in the future years? Because as I noticed in the beginning of our chat, uh, it becomes more and more ideologized, a lot of uh, like those climate ideologies, env environmentalism uh, comes into play when, it, uh, when we're talking about economic policies. So will Ukraine when joining Europe, will Ukraine will be joining a space of markets, space of entrepreneurship, in your opinion? Or maybe it has to kind of develop its own strength in this matter, rather than counting that it will import this mindset from somewhere else? Well, I, I do see a lot more, say, software companies and app startups in China than I do in Europe. Um, in the U.S., there are a lot of negative trends, but I don't, uh, two in particular are, are DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that focuses more on physical and identity uh, uh, attributes rather than merit, and uh, lack of free speech and expression on college campuses. Those are, those are two really negative trends in the U.S., in my view. And uh, good news is that we're seeing some pushback against them. Uh, for example, uh, just this morning it was reported that 100 professors at Harvard are protesting the lack of free speech at Harvard. So that's good. Uh, I don't see those negative trends directly impacting uh, entrepreneurship, though, at least not directly. Uh, here's here's a, here's something in the U.S. that does or did, and continues to directly impact uh, negatively entrepreneurship, and that is uh, about a decade ago, President Obama was on a kick of "You didn't build that." Who here remembers that or heard about that? Quite a few of us. Uh, what a sad mindset. Uh, for uh, the leader of the largest and strongest country in the free world to have and to promote. I suppose what he was trying to say was that, hey, you entrepreneurs, uh, you're benefiting from all the investments government has made, like in education, in infrastructure, uh, and so forth. Uh, okay. Uh, but it actually sounded more like a put-down to me. Uh, you didn't build that. You don't deserve credit for it. Well, entrepreneur, we need entrepreneurs, all of us, uh, for you know, new innovations, for making products and services that are already out there more cost-effective, um, in, in, also for creating jobs. Uh, it's not very widely recognized that most of the new job creation comes not from large, well-established companies, but from smaller companies that are growing rapidly. The, the, the new job creation that's created by large companies is when they acquire these small companies. So most of the job growth comes from entrepreneurship. Uh, so, and, and starting a business is the hardest thing you can do. I, I got one of my 
startups through both the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 and the financial crisis of 2008, the hardest thing I've ever done. So we should be celebrating those, those uh, entrepreneurs rather than uh, putting them down, in my view. So that's something negative. Turning to, in the US, turning to Europe, I, I, the, the panel we just had was so illuminating about how so much of EU regulation is protectionist now, and, and I see that, absolutely. Uh, I think of uh, GDPR, for example, the general data protection regulations and, and other regulations. Um, these benefit well-established IT companies uh, who can afford to comply with them. Uh, they harm startups who generally don't have the resources to, uh, or the time to comply with regulations. Uh, the benefits of these regulations may be visible and immediate, but the costs are much less visible and longer term. And that's of fewer companies that are started and hence fewer innovations and improvements in quality of life. And so all of us here need, it seems to me, need to make those costs as visible as possible and talk about them as much as possible. Here's another example, ChatGPT. How many people here have used chat GPT, just about all of us, it's, it seems like. It cr is creating many opportunities for both entrepreneurs and for increases in productivity. Uh, it's speeding up or simplifying the work of many knowledge workers. It's allowing lower skilled people to do jobs that only higher skilled people used to be able to do in programming, in IT, in marketing, in accounting, finance, you name it. Uh, Italy uh, is has banned chat GDP over data privacy concerns, if my understanding is correct. And uh, it's the first European country to do so. I understand that France, Germany, and, and Ireland may do likewise. What a shame. Uh, th watch those countries' productivity and competitiveness decline as uh, other countries, uh, relative to other countries whose professionals are adopting and, and applying chat GPT and, and other AI technologies. Uh, so uh, those are some thoughts on the mindset in, mm -hmm. in Europe as I see it. I'd like, to, I'd like you, uh, you to put uh, more of Ukraine into the, the context. You know, recently I've written a long piece on the demographic of Ukraine. So uh, entrepreneurship is usually related to the uh, to the young people, or relatively young people. Ukraine has a huge uh, demographic problem, much bigger than Poland. So to give you like a few numbers, in 1993, there was like 52 million people living in Ukraine. Now it's, according to various estimates, in between 37 and 42. You, can, you, you don't have like a very good numbers on that, but it's like 10 million, over 10 million less fewer people than, than 12, 30 years ago. In Poland, thanks to immigration mostly, uh, the number didn't change. We, we are talking about the problem with our demographics, but in 1993 we had 38 million people. Now we have 38 million people. Of course, the structure is, is not very uh, good because there is a lot more um, old people, but still. So this is, this is one number that tells you a lot about the, the crisis uh, in Ukraine. Their uh, youth is escaping, emigrating to other parts of the world. So, is entrepreneurship uh, able to, uh, after the war ends, rescue the country? How, if there will be nobody to uh, actually perform entrepreneurial activities? Uh, do you think that there are tools to make people, to, uh, to make entrepreneurial activities attractive in, in Ukraine? How to do it? How to build this capacity? Well, uh, first of all, the number one thing you need to start a business is a real, unsatisfied customer need. And uh, during wartime, uh, there are lots of new needs that people have. Uh, they have a need for medical care. Uh, they may have lost their home. They need new places to live. Um, they need food delivered, perhaps, to their homes. Uh, even they need to be able to keep in touch with loved ones. 
even if they can't go outside or visit. They, uh, if, even if life continues somewhat normally, they need to continue their education and physical fitness and, and any number of, of needs that are uh, maybe different if the usual suppliers can't provide them. Uh, all of these things are things that businesses in the Ukraine are providing during the war as soon as a region is deoccupied. We see that with uh, grocery stores and private postal services in particular. Uh, the businesses who are providing such services are gaining knowledge, they're gaining experience, and, and customers who trust them. And so after the war, it will be very natural uh, to evolve and grow these businesses, I think, into successful businesses. Uh, crises bring people together. Uh, Ukraine, what Ukraine has done so far, to me, has been awe-inspiring. Uh, they've successfully kept at bay a much larger uh, aggressor nation. Um, that bonding together that Ukraine has experienced uh, is a great national asset uh, that shouldn't be squandered or trifled with. Uh, and I see Ukraine having the potential to emerge from the war uh, with parallels to Israel, uh, self-confident, uh, strong, and highly entrepreneurial. Uh, after the war, <clears throat> surely the U.S., EU, and other foreign powers uh, will uh, offer Ukraine much in the way of foreign aid. And uh, a desire to help people is a good thing. Uh, but I would think Ukraine would want to have eyes wide open about this. Uh, some types of aid are helpful and some are unhelpful. Uh, we saw in Haiti, for example, how huge shipments of rice uh, put uh, by the US government put rice farmers out of business. How can they compete with free rice? Uh, in Africa, <clears throat> Tom's, a shoe manufacturer, provided hundreds of thousands of free pairs of shoes. Uh, that put cobblers in villages across Africa out of business. How could they compete with free shoes? Uh, worst of all, such goods are usually short-lived. Uh, it's not sustainable to give stuff away indefinitely. And so these uh, small business people shift to other areas and then at some point uh, after they've shifted, the supply of free goods dries up and there really is a shortage in those goods. So uh, in, in re Ukraine, we've seen this happen with grocery stores. Food has come in, grocery stores have not been able to compete. They've gone out of business and that's been ultimately counterproductive. So be cautious about any form of aid, it seems to me, that might create a learned dependency, which is ultimately detrimental to any society or country. What kind of foreign aid is helpful? Well, uh, how about eliminating all import and export tariffs to Ukraine, as, as the EU has done, and uh, in, instead of succumbing to protectionism, as some individual countries have done, uh, doing so makes Ukraine imports more, uh, uh, more affordable and makes exports uh, more competitive, getting rid of those tariffs. Um, foreign direct investment uh, is a good thing that builds manufacturing capacity and funds technology development. That's good. Remittances are good uh, from re re Ukrainian expatriates back to Ukraine. Uh, uh, you can spend, Ukrainians can spend the money however they wish. That gives them lots of flexibility, has more value than providing specific goods and services. Uh, but foreign aid of any kind, it seems to me, is not as important as what Ukraine can do for itself to get back on its feet. 
And uh, to gain guidance on that, I would uh, suggest looking at as tools uh, the uh, freedom, the various freedom indices. For example, the uh, Ease of Doing Business Index, formerly managed by the World Bank and the Fraser Economic Freedom uh, of the World Report. Each of these ranks uh, uh, Ukraine on uh, a variety of different dimensions. For example, the uh, ease of doing business on uh, how easy is it to get title to property, i.e. protection of property rights. How easy is it to get electricity? Uh, how easy is it to start up a new business and so forth? And uh, on each of these uh, the indices, uh, the uh, report will tell you how Ukraine ranks or performs individually on each index or each component of the index and overall. Well, great. That provides a roadmap uh, for where to focus. Look for the areas where the mo there's the opportunity for biggest improvement. Uh, is wherever Ukraine stands on these indices, something that will help every single person in the country uh, is, and it's an aggressive, achievable, and measurable goal, is to cut your rank in half <clears throat> in the next five years. So if, say, Ukraine is currently ranked number 70 in the world, as they were uh, in uh, 2022 on one of the indices, make it a goal to rank 35th after, uh, say, five years. Lots of countries have made big gains like that. India went from 130 to 100 in one year. If so, Ukraine can cut its rank in half in five years. You can track your progress because you can figure out how much you need to gain by every year, improve by every year. Uh, and uh, doing this, as I said, will benefit everyone. It'll make it easier for entrepreneurs to get started, for people to, be, to rebuild, to trade, to innovate, to export, and to import. And it'll make Ukraine more attractive for foreign direct investment. Uh, a specific question I was asked to address is how can Ukraine attract venture capital? I've, I'm a angel investor, and I've invested uh, eight or 10 years ago in a company in Poland. Uh, uh, Fido Intelligence was uh, in uh, Gdansk, it was a spin out from Gdansk Polytechnic Institute in natural language processing. Uh, the founder is Michal Rochinsky, a good friend. I'd be founder and CEO. I'd, if anyone is interested, I would be happy to put you in touch with him. And he moved the headquarters of the company to the US, but kept the software development team uh, in uh, the Gdansk area. And uh, anyway, uh, what, can Ukraine, what can Ukraine do? Well, uh, I would emphasize you, the fact that you are able to survive in any conditions, you, your company. You made it through the war. If you can do that, uh, everything else is a piece of cake. And I, re I personally experienced that getting through the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 after that. Anything that the market or the world could throw at us was easy. Um, there, uh, the car rental agency, Avis, uh, used to have as its slogan, we try harder. Uh, I can imagine Ukrainian startups having that as their slogan. Hey, we realize that uh, we've, uh, you know, had a tough time. We try harder than the competition. Uh, a lower cost of labor would be a key selling point as well, regardless of uh, what the services are. Uh, so uh, to, just to conclude, um, Adam Smith in 1776 in uh, The Wealth of Nations said, uh, little else is required to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism but peace, easy taxes, 
and a tolerable administration of justice. So if the Ukrainian government can just get those three things right, uh, leave the rest up the, to the Ukrainian people and watch magic happen. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Well, to add something, we in Poland have peace, thank God, but uh, we don't have easy taxes, we don't have a uh, tolerable justice system, and yet we thrive. So maybe the peace is the most important of them all. Thank you so much for your uh, talk, and the, um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ron uh, Manners on stage. Uh, Ron. <laughs> He's a man of various trades, but first of all, he is a businessman uh, engaged in mining in Australia. A member of Mount Pelerin Society. That's something cool, right? Especially for this surrounding. He was a colleague with Friedrich von Hayek, so that tells you a lot. That tells you a lot. And Ron would like to uh, give a short keynote to our next panel on the rebuilding of Ukraine. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I, uh... I want, uh, I've got a button to press here, I think. Yeah, I've been told. Press it once. Oh. Just a moment. Here we go. Once more. Don't worry, 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 Okay, on the computer, but it's not okay here. <laughs> it's too small to look at. What's going on? It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Listen. I, 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 Ron, Ron, you need to use the mic, all right? I've got to use the mic. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. I want, to, I want to mention there's a... <clears throat> I feel as though I've got a stake in Ukraine's success. About eight years ago, on my very first visit to Ukraine, I saw... They were coming out of this, uh, they were celebrating the Maidan Revolution. And uh, I was so impressed at these young people, the courage and the spirit, the way they threw off the chains of a, of a, of a dysfunctional and <laughs> corrupt government. And I thought, my God, what an example for the rest of the world. Well, they're all suffering to a degree of the same sort of thing. Here's an example. I thought, this is just fabulous. And uh, I've been taking an interest, so I feel as I've got a stake in the success. Of, of Ukraine and this, uh, this experiment. And uh, you've just got to get it over the hump because what an example that will be to triumph over what's happening at the moment. So I've, I've compiled some stuff here about a 10 minute speech, but I'm going to condense it down to three minutes. But don't, don't worry, there's a lot of links in this. Don't miss them. They're all, all on here in that link, but you can't read that. So the the fourth slide, there's four slides, the fourth slide has got a QR code. So capture that and study all the links and the stuff that's covering in there. But I'll tell you the, the good news that I want to tell you today, that the, the revolution in what's got to happen is, has been so often in the hands of one person. One person. And in, the, in, the, in my paper I explain how, how, for instance, one person did so much damage, and his name was, was Antonio Gramsci. And one person could do so much damage by using strategies that were embedded, and we can't, we can't get rid of the influence of Gramsci. Now, so, but on the other side, on the good guys' side, one person was responsible for the economic reforms and success of Hong Kong. His name was... Sir John Kelpathwaite. There's some links that tells you all about his, his success. One person was responsible for the fantastic reforms of New Zealand in the 19, early 1980s. One person. Then, again, one person was responsible for the success in the Australian economic reforms, which I was fortunate enough to be in business. This there's a lot of stuff. When you get into the speech, get into this stuff. There's a lot of stuff in here, but the reforms were called the Hawke Keating Walsh Drys reforms in here. One person, John Hyde, was a director of our Mancal Foundation for so many years. He's just retired. But 
He was, one person was responsible for what happened from here right through to there. A, who just happened to be in business during that time? Me. How lucky was I to be there for this revolution caused by one guy. So never forget, don't worry, don't worry about having to have a 51% majority to do anything. It's one person can do all this sort of stuff. It's worthwhile just studying the success of each of those people and how they achieved that. Now, Yep. Quickly. Quickly. This is wasting time. John Hyde's uh, inspiration was re behind our, the formation of our Mankell Economic Education Foundation, and we produced a project, Project Western Australia book, which we circulated. Every member of state parliament got a copy, a hard copy, copy of this at the, elite, at the last election. It covers every, every aspect of the economy, education, transport, the whole works, health, everything is in this. These are the things, once you get into politics, you're too busy kissing babies and being nice to people, but this is a little manual telling people what's got to be done if they're going to be successful. We've circulated through Tom Palmer and the Atlas Network. We've circulated copies of this into, uh, into Ukraine. We've had uh, 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 Marian Zablotsky, the uh, uh, Ukrainian Member of Parliament, zooming into our office to discuss this and other reforms. So it's, it's got a life of its own. And in the, uh, in the text of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this on, on the link that I'll give you, it's got the, uh, the, the soft copy, so you can get onto the, the full text of this uh, reform paper, which I'll, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave with you. Now, all that sounds pretty simple, but most of these really major reforms that were done by some people didn't stick. So the second thing I've got to tell you, one is it's one person behind these reforms, but the second and equally most important thing is how to make those reforms stick. That's the secret. And if we get a chance to reform any economy again, equal time must be given to making those reforms stick. And there's a whole section in there, and I've used the, uh, the uh, so a lot of, uh, a lot of, references and books and the, the strategies of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, of how to make these stick, but I won't go into them now, but that's terribly important because if we get another chance, we've got to make them stick and we don't have to uh, enter into a false sense of jubilation and find our, our hopes were dashed again. We celebrated, obviously, with a, the Cato Institute, when we went to a team of 40 of us went to Russia in September 1990 with a, around a seminar called uh, um, the Transition to Freedom. And uh, we were there while the Soviet Union was falling apart. We rejoiced, saying, <laughs> that's the end of those guys, but how, how wrong were we? <laughs> so so, we, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get another chance. And, uh, uh, Professor Nils Carson, Carson in his book, which I've detailed in the thing, uh, explains several strategies that must be adopted to keep these, these reforms alive. So in conclusion, um, let me uh, urge you to uh, seek out that one person in your area, in your country, Seek out that one person that you think is able to make a transition to these economic reforms and or either be that one person yourself or support that person with all your heart and equally lock in those strategies to make, for, make it absolutely impossible for those reforms to be undone. And that will be your major contribution in restoring our civilization.
that's the challenge I'll leave with you. And the final slide, of course. Grab that uh, QR code and you can get the mull over and chew over the whole gutsy stuff that's in there. Thank you, and I'm so happy to be here with you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe Ukraine is waiting for this kind of person, but without this mustache, probably. Okay. Mm, I didn't expect this mustache to, to appear there. That's us, yeah. Uh, okay, let me, in, let me invite you to the last part of our evening, uh, the panel. Uh, we're talking about very general and various issues, but now we're going to focus on very 